Welcome back to iHeartRadio, So Bad It's Good. Today, we have somebody that is so good, it's great. Uh, he is so respected in his field, and you guys know how hard I geek out on reporters and things that I, I mean, this is a man that I would watch as appointment television on Dateline NBC uh, uh, over a decade ago. You guys might remember him from Dateline to catch a predator. Uh, he is just truly incredible at what he does. And I want to find out how he even got into this field, but this is really exciting. He actually has two new series that have uh, premiered on the True Blue streaming network. And you guys, it is so easy to get there. You just get watchtrueblue.com. All the information will be on the show notes. He has True Crime Nation, which takes viewers inside the most most compelling crime stories. Uh, they He interviewed one of the Q uh, survivors from the club, uh, which was just a fascinating interview. And he also has Takedown, which is kind of an update to the legendary To Catch a Predator series. And I was watching that. I was watching multiple episodes today, and I just forgot how intense that can be. But he has been doing this for nearly four decades. He has done uh, programs for Discovery+. Plus. I remember watching the Onision one uh, about a year and a half ago. He did the Peter Nygaard investigation. He also has a top rated podcast called Predators I Have Caught with Chris Hansen. But ladies and gentlemen, just one of the top of his field, Chris Hansen, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I mean, this is such a... I, I hate to say it's such a pleasure to talk to you because you deal in such intense work, but it really has... Uh, you've been such a part of my TV viewing uh for for so long it was sort of my habit for all of us you were kind of one of those cornerstones of this but what a what a wild way to what, the work you do is so intense how did you even get involved in any of this to begin with well you know i started a long time ago uh, i grew up in the detroit area and, and uh, about a mile and a half away from where jimmy hoffa was kidnapped and i got bit by the bug back then i used to ride my bike up there and, and check out the crime scene and see the fbi agents and the police and the local reporters and the fbi agents and so when i went off to college at michigan state i just signed up for the radio station and started being a reporter and and was lucky enough to get into local television and work my way up through uh, tampa detroit the network and you know, do a lot of different, very important investigative and breaking stories through the years that kind of prepared me for the work I do now with uh, the new predator investigations, the new crime documentaries, and, and to be able to use the enterprising techniques that we have done for so many years with the predator investigations and so many of the other projects, and to apply those now to the distribution of the content and to get it to the people who want to see it is really becoming a rewarding experience. So, you know, my whole motto, Ryan, has always been to take people inside a crime, let them see things and hear things they wouldn't normally hear and see anywhere else on this journey of discovery. And, you know, one of the lessons the Predator franchise has taught us is that when you take folks inside the commission of a felony, essentially, and you get inside the mind of a predator or a criminal and you hear the voice of a victim, you can then perhaps help people avoid from becoming victims in the future. And along the way, it's very compelling television. It really is compelling television. And you are the perfect moderator or narrator to take us through that. And like you said, even on this, the new series on uh, True Blue, you know, you're dealing with local law enforcement. We're seeing the setup. We're seeing, and, and I just, I mean, how do you prepare yourself? Do you remember the first one on To Catch a Predator of, because you had oh, a yeah. walk walk in and and talk to these people uh, did you remember the night before were you nervous how did you prepare for something like this well I, I was very nervous the first time we did it I, I was nervous most of all because I didn't know anybody would show up you know I wondered on the drive out to Long Island where we did the very first sting 18 years ago uh, if I had just wasted tens of thousands of dollars of the network's money with nobody showing up literally, Within minutes of having that thought, traffic cleared. I started driving again, and my producer calls and said, where the hell are you? We've got two guys scheduled to show up in 45 minutes. And that began two and a half days of 17 guys, 17, 18 guys surfacing in that investigation, including a New York City firefighter. Now, in those Which early got days, yeah. 
I mean, that's got to be horrifying, though. Like, at least like your project that you had like conceived and conceptualized and all of this, you know, at least it's working. But at the same time, that's horrifying that the amount of people I mean, you're responsible for over like exposing 400 people. I mean, you, you've been responsible and the show and your work has done so much good. But at the same time, that's got to be horrifying to realize how much of this is out there. Well, imagine this. In the beginning, we didn't uh, collaborate for the first two investigations with law enforcement. We we didn't know what was going to happen. We partnered with a um, an online watchdog group called Perverted Justice, and they did the decoy work. And I had security. Ron Knight was with me, and our team of camera people. and And these guys just showed up. I confronted them, and they left. And in some cases, they were prosecuted after the fact. In both New York and in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. after that. But by the third investigation, we realized the only socially responsible way to proceed was to partner or collaborate in some way or do a parallel investigation with actual law enforcement. And, and also, you know, as a television producer, it was very unfulfilling to see these guys get confronted and then just walk out the door and face no consequences. So. Over the years, we have adapted to various law enforcement agencies to work with them. In most cases, I still get to confront the, the um, uh, predator first, and depending on what happens, law enforcement moves in. Sometimes I get a chance to talk to the predator afterwards, and these interviews in the new episodes turn into almost like this silence of the lambs experience where these guys spill their guts to me and try to explain how they ended up in this situation and what made them prey upon a child. And we still get those guys who claim that they were good Samaritans and they're only there to help this child out and set them straight. And I mean, I'm in Florida and a guy online says to the decoy, posing as a 12 year old girl, this isn't one of those Chris Hansen things, is it? And she says, who's that? And, and so he shows up and then he's giddy almost have a fanboy experience sitting across from me being interrogated about the crimes he's just committed. It still su- stuns me, Ryan, every time we go out and do it. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it, like these, these people know you, like these people, you are the man that people recognize the most when it comes to this, which I find very interesting. Even like I was watching glory hole, Jerry, which is one of, I think, uh, <laughs> or I think that's the name, yeah. one of the episodes on the new streaming network. And, you know, he knows exactly who you are. And then he's like, Hey, I have back issues. Come on, you guys. And it's very, it's, it's, it's really just kind of haunting, but you're seeing, Sitting there very calmly asking him questions, you know, you're, you're, you keep going persistent. And I just feel like you have been so road tested with this, that you really, you handle these so gracefully in kind of such an, so for some evil, evil people. Well, you know, look, uh, anybody can jump out of the bushes or from behind a curtain and scare somebody and create 10 seconds of, you know, shocking television. Uh, my job is to not only create compelling television, but to get inside these guys' minds, to have a conversation. You know, I could make a guy run away, run down the street, jump in his car, or his golf cart, or do whatever. But I, I want to talk to the guy. I remain curious as to what these guys have to say. You know, 500 guys are so into this. And, you know, just one of the many franchises we've done over the years and continue to do, but obviously it's the become the most iconic. But I still genuinely want to know what was going on in this person's mind. I, I have my theories on what makes these guys do what they do. I'm not a therapist, but I, I've sure talked to enough of them. Uh, but, but there's no shortage of them. And I guess that's the shocking part. In the beginning, we merely had decoys in chat rooms on AOL and Yahoo. Well, today, as you well know, there has been an explosion in the number of social media platforms upon which adults can approach children. And so, especially during the pandemic, uh, organizations like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, with which we, we work on some projects, will tell you that the number of inappropriate contacts between adults and children, the amount of inappropriate material transmitted between adults and children skyrocketed like 900% during the pandemic. So 
as much as I'd like to say we've had a deterrent impact here because it's now so diffuse, because the internet continues to be so ubiquitous, this activity is more prevalent than ever. And that's why our job is more important than ever, I think. Yeah, and it's more, and it's kind of like a cancer because it kind of like develop, like it tries to find new ways to get past, like you are like, you know, oh, are you Chris Hansen? People are trying to find new ways to get past what you guys have already set up in terms of sting operations. I feel like they probably find new ways and new ways. And there's always new technology to keep up with in the 18 years or so that you've been doing this. Are there like the, what are the similarities that you've like, there's always this, there's always this for every person that I uh, catch. Almost universally, Ryan, the grooming pattern is the same. When you and I were growing up, uh, our parents told us, don't talk to strangers. It was good advice then. It's good advice today. But the problem with the Internet and the ability of these guys to groom children is that the guy who's a stranger on Wednesday may not be a stranger on Friday. And when I go back and do the podcast, the Predators I've Caught podcast, which you mentioned earlier, I delve into the previous cases. So sometimes in the heat of the moment, I'm operating on the fly, right? I've got some transcripts, I've got some background, but I, I have to get information out of the guy and s- formulate and create the safe environment uh, uh, with questions uh, to get to what this guy, what brought this guy into the situation. In the podcast, I get to go back and immerse myself in the transcripts, in the history, in the background of this guy, find out what he's doing today. And, and I tell you, there is almost a template used to break down the traditional barriers that, and barriers that exist in society between adults and children. You're cute. Do you have a boyfriend? I can't believe you don't have a boyfriend, somebody as beautiful as you. Does it bother you that I'm older? Now, many times these guys are you know, 50 years old and say they're 33, like that makes a difference. I still don't understand yeah, yeah. why they think that's okay. Yeah. And, and, and they start breaking down, you know, uh, what's your parents' situation? You know, I'm divorced. My dad's an airline pilot. Oh, you're home alone a lot. Yeah. Well, oh, gee, you probably wouldn't want an older guy like me visiting, would you? And oh yeah. And, you know, the decoy knows how to play the role without creating entrapment. Um, in, in a lot of the cases we do now, the decoy is actually a member of law enforcement and it creates an easier prosecution. You know, there are a lot of vigilante groups out there who try to do similar things. And and I'm not against citizen journalists, of course, but they're very difficult cases to prosecute. So if you expose somebody and you put it on television or you put it on uh, YouTube or something and the, the guy's not prosecuted, what good have you done? We've had to adapt to make sure that we're socially responsible and we get these successful prosecutions. And almost universally, that's what happens. Well, uh, so the the other thing that I find interesting, especially about the True Blue streaming, is the True Crime Nation, it shows like another uh, kind of one of your strengths, is just interviewing people that have gone on through these traumatic occurrences. And I mean, I can't believe you got, I mean, the, the first one I watched was with one of the survivors of the most recent, uh, shooting at the, the Q club in Colorado. He was shot seven times. I think his name was Barrett and you're speaking to him, I believe from a hospital bed. I mean, how did you even get that interview? And it's like, but it's a completely different wheelhouse, but I, you're so, I mean, that's just another one of your strengths. Was that part of going to true blue is like, I also want to be able to interview people out there in the news and victims and survivors and things of that nature. And I've done a lot of that over the years at Dateline, at Crime Watch Daily, at, at uh, Discovery, and, and, and all of that. We did you know crimes that were not predator cases. But the benefit of doing True Crime Nation is that we have 40 years of experience and connections in law enforcement. We have the Predator franchise, which has now gone into its third generation of fans and followers. So if I show up at a place or if I make a phone call, the real the, the the reality is is that these people will be more uh, willing to talk to me because they know they're they're in a trusted environment. And and for instance, Barrett, who's in the hospital, shot seven times in his body, twice in his in his arms, nine times total. He didn't even realize he was shot nine times until later. Here's a guy who was at this club just out for a, a nice evening. The guy walks in, opens fire, 
And he runs out of the back door bleeding, goes to a 7-Eleven, calls 911, and then calls his dad to say, hey, I love you. I may not make it here. And miraculously, shot all those times, nothing hits a major organ, nothing hits a, a, you know, a, a nerve or any part of his spine. And he He's going to be okay, but he was lying in his hospital bed, as you saw, as you can see on, on True Blue, giving me the interview. We have other interviews yeah, yeah. For, for from that incident that we will put together in a larger documentary for True Blue. True Crime Nation allows us to report on a lot of different crime stories and put it together into a news magazine format. So this horrible tragedy in, in Idaho and uh, in Moscow at the college campus there, oh my we'll gosh, be reporting yeah. on that. So we'll be we're working on that right now. This this case of the the woman from North Carolina who went to Mexico and was killed there. That's a fascinating story. But all these cases we can have access to. I can go there or we can do some of this work remotely. And and it creates for a very compelling show. Um, You know, the Casey Anthony is now out there doing an interview in a new documentary. I interviewed her parents uh, a few years back in an exclusive interview. We have access to all this material. So we have not just new material, but I have a, a lifetime, a professional lifetime of context and access that you're really not going to find anywhere before. And the, the magic of True Blue is that we can turn these things around quickly. You mentioned the Peter Nygaard documentary series. You mentioned the Onision in yeah. Real Life. Those projects were 12 and 18 months, respectively, to put together by the time you go through the bureaucracy of a major network, the A meeting, the B meeting, the you know, green light meeting, all that. Right now, I call Sean Reck in Cleveland, Ohio and say, I need a crew on Thursday and I have a crew on Thursday. So when somebody comes to me, a group of women, as they did in this other big story we're working on about this Facebook fiend, and they tell me that there's a guy out there who's been romancing and abusing and stealing money from women all over the country. And they sit down and give me the interviews and we refer them to law enforcement around the country. And now there's a warrant for this guy's arrest, which will likely be on scene when they pick him up. That's a great, compelling story. But we've turned that thing around in a matter of weeks and months, not a year. And so, again, it's really just applying the enterprising techniques we've done in reporting to also the distribution of this content, the ownership of it, the control of it. And, and, I, and I think it, for a guy like me at my stage of the game, I think it's the future of this business. Honestly, I do. I, I, I got to say, I was shocked when I did uh, open the first episode and it was about the Q shooting with the victim. I was like, that just happened. This was just weeks ago and you already yeah. have an interview up there. I was expecting something from like a year ago or some kind of, this was like direct. I was like, wow, the turnaround on this. And it was so immediate and so personal. And I was so taken by it. And, you know, that mixed with uh, the to catch a predators types, you know, the takedown as well. I just, I was like, wow, this is a one-stop shop for everything that kind of fascinates. I think a lot of my audience, you guys, this is something really worthwhile. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is, I don't know how you view this is the culture of celebrity is that no matter if you like it or not, you are now in a pantheon of kind of celebrity in a weird, I mean, they, they put parried you, parodied you on family guy. Like, you know, I remember like, Oh, just stay right there, sir. Like I remember <laughs> watching To Catch a Predator every week with my girlfriend at the time, and it was appointment television, and we would watch it. And I know it was so dark, but we were so uh, it was so gripping and fascinating to watch. But that was because of you. You kind of became a celebrity because of this. What is your take on celebrity culture and you being a part of it? You know, I try to take the celebrity culture part of it with a grain of salt. You know, I always joke, you know, my older kids went to a high school where uh, dads did a lot of cool stuff. You know, they're shipbuilders and Wall Street <laughs> guys and, you know, sports <laughs> sports figures. And so having a dad on TV wasn't a big deal until South Park did a Chris Hansen Predator episode and I was the coolest dad in the bunch. <laughs> now, you know, there's been a lot of that. You know, I, I you know, was on The Boys, which is a very popular series, and and, and yeah. many others. And so, I never uh, have a problem with being parodied or poked fun at because, at the end of the day, all it does is build the franchise and bring attention. 
to a very important subject, which is the protection of children in our society and the education of people so they do not become victims of crime. And that's the bottom line. So if people want to poke fun at me, whether it's South Park or Simpsons or, you know, Family Guy or any of that stuff, I- I'm fine with that. You know, I, I, mean, I almost is, think it's an homage. I don't even think it's poking fun at yeah. times. I think it's like you are a part of the fabric of things that we really, really kind of respect and, and view you like you are a trusted name in this uh, in this area, like that's w- the Chris Hansen name. Like I got an email saying, do you want to speak to Chris Hansen? And I was like, are you out of your mind? Of course I want to speak to Chris Hansen like that. Who wouldn't want to speak to Chris Hansen? And it was just fascinating the career you have. Do you think you are now like all these years into it, the best that you've ever been? Like you still have the same passion? Oh, I think, I think, uh, absolutely. I think everything I've done, and, and, you know, I always joke, uh, you know, about having 10 Emmys and all that, none of which are for Predator, you know, uh, yeah. it's sort of a different category of, of news and documentary. But I, I, I think it has. I mean, I'm at a great station in life, you know, personally and professionally and, you know, physically. And, and, and you know, I'm just I'm thrilled with where everything is. You know, our kids are great. Our, and my wife is great. Our family is great. And this true blue network is a marvelous opportunity. And, and, you know, you sometimes spend a lot of years and while they're very successful years, but you need to find the right combination and the right timing. And it doesn't always come together with every project as I'm sure, you know, you know, you're in this business too. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it, it, it really has, I mean, I'm really in tune with all this. And, and I have nothing but energy and drive and curiosity and compassion for, for, for what we do. And, um, yeah, I mean, you got, it, it, it's, I mean, it's going to show in the Emmys. 10 Emmys, five Edward R. Murrow awards. I mean, your YouTube channel is, uh, I mean, insane in the amount of subscribers. It just seems like there are so many things that you've been involved with, with that have just kind of, uh, skyrocketed. Um, as we start winding down here, uh, in terms of the uh, true blue, you know, with I was talking about uh, Glory Hole Jerry or whoever it was. Was there anybody that surprised you on the new series? Is there any kind of new type of predator out there that you uh, encountered or anything that will still surprise you uh, to this day? Yeah, I, I honestly, I think what surprises me most, Ryan, is that these guys know that we're out there and it's not just is chris hansen out there they know the sheriffs they know the the police department it, there's a lot of this activity going on in law enforcement where i'm not involved and yet they still cannot resist the potential of meeting a child for sex they, they, they're driven this blurring of the lines between fantasy and reality and the barriers between children and adults we have in the society. And it's all fed by the, the addictive nature of the internet, the, the 24 seven access and the anonymity. People say things online they wouldn't say face to face and, and they, they can't resist it. And there's a certain element of society, clearly because of everything I've seen, which, which will prey on children. And, and for whatever combination of reasons, they think that this is okay and they're gonna risk everything and try and get away with it. And and remember, these guys come from all walks of life. In in the most recent investigation, we had a guy who was uh, in town on business. Uh, We had a guy who made his living working for a company which sold software to schools to protect kids online from this very sort of activity. And here he is showing up for a young girl. I mean, come on, trying to tell me that he was a do-gooder. And in one of the extended investigations we had, we had a guy who was a deputy police chief in a town outside of Atlanta who was in Orlando for a polygrapher's conference who shows up at a sting house in a human trafficking investigation that was done in a parallel fashion to the, to the child predator sting. And, and here he is, a deputy police chief in for a polygrapher's convention and drives his department vehicle to the sting. And the next day, the Polk County Sheriff's Department has to call his department and say, hey, we got your guy. (laughs) 
uh, I, yeah, I mean, the one uh, I, I'm working my way through them, but the one that I keep bringing the glory hole one, you know, he gives up that there's other people in the area just like him, that there is a group of like men just like him in the same area and they all know each other. And that thought just haunted me of just like, wow, yeah. it's like and a then club. The other, the other thing he said was, you know, he pointed out another fellow who drives around in a golf cart. He was the guy we busted the, the right before. The first, uh, yeah, the beginning. Gary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, it was really, really tragic uh, and uh, but also very gripping to watch you guys. Um, uh, the holidays are coming up and I know you have kids as well. I mean, wh what do you recommend? I have a lot of parents that listen to this uh, in terms of online. And you said everything's so accessible now with Instagram, Twitter, all of these things. I mean, I just saw on your Twitter the other day, somebody got verified as the official Chris Hansen. Oh, yeah. And you got them yeah. taken down. What do you recommend for parents out there with kids and especially around the holidays, they're, they're getting off school. They have plenty of time. Like, do you start to formulate things that parents can do to like help their oh, kids? Stay absolutely. Away from this? I, I think the lesson of this investigative franchise is that no matter how many times we do it, no matter how active law enforcement is in this space, it's going to continue. So the best defense is education of your child. It's not like the drug addiction problem where you can do demand reduction. There is no demand reduction here. There is um, education and dialogue. So I think you have to start with your children at the very early age of when they started going online and you start with an age appropriate discussion, uh, something along the lines of, look, there are adults out there who like to trick kids. Kids don't like to be tricked. And then you have to amp up that discussion as the child matures and explores different areas of the internet. And I think the basic rule early on, and I'm convinced that this is the way to go, is to teach kids that if you don't know that person in real life, you don't know who that person is online. Because the guy who says he's a cute surfer dude from San Diego and who's 15 could really be a 53 year old fat man in his underwear in his mom's basement surrounded by empty pizza boxes. And I don't think there's any harm in being that graphic to, to make the point. And that stuff sticks. When I speak to kids in schools, when I speak to organizations dedicated to the protection of our children in this country, I often tell those stories and, and, you see the light bulb go off and, and that's, you have to be a realist and realize that, that no government agency, no journalist, nobody can protect your kids 24 seven. You need to create that barrier of security around your child. And it starts with a dialogue and education and it, you have to maintain that all the way through. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a niece and she was playing on Roblox, which is a game, but it has a chat feature on it that yeah. like older men will try to chat with younger uh, kids on that thing. And I'm like, this oh, is yeah. a game for kids. Oh, it's yeah. shocking. And then even Balenciaga, you, know, you have that ad campaign. It seems sure. like the proliferation is so out there in pop culture right now where they're really pushing this. So I feel like you uh, in this area have to be busier than ever just because oh, it yeah. seems to be popping up so much. Before I jumped on with you, Ryan, I was on the phone with my, one of my producers talking about a case of a 12 year old girl who was on Instagram. Now you think your kids are safe on Instagram. There was a guy in Florida, this girl was in Michigan, a guy in Florida started a conversation with her, lured her into a DM a couple days go by. And he's now convinced her that she should leave her home with her family, climb out her bedroom window, meet him in a church parking lot, takes her to a hotel rapes her. She goes to the emergency room the next day. They start piecing it backwards. The Genesee County Sheriff's Department in mid-Michigan goes to the hotel, gets the security video, pieces it together, sends the detectives down to Florida where this guy lives. They bust him. He gives it up. And it turns out he's guilty or he confesses to at least two other cases in two other states. It's a 12-year-old girl on Instagram, right? Now, you know, I... I I don't think of Instagram as a dangerous place, but it's and it, this isn't happening every day on Instagram. And, and this isn't about Instagram. It's about every social media platform out there where there is the potential for this sort of activity to take place. And I parents need we, to be aware of that. 
when you initially did uh, this on Dateline, it was like before even, I mean, this was before Twitter was even, this was before, yeah. I mean, we had Facebook, we had MySpace, but I mean, the proliferation of all of these social medias has just made everything so much more crazy and so much more intense. Uh, so I really appreciate the work you do. It just seems like the most intense work imaginable though. I mean, I just can't imagine how you carry yourself day to day knowing kind of the darkest recesses of the human mind. Well, you sort of get used to dealing with it. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I happen to uh, process it pretty well, you know, and I get asked that all the time. Do you see a therapist? Do you do this? Do you do that? And, and, and uh, you know, I probably should, but, I, you know, I, I honestly, you know, the, the podcast, as crazy as it sounds, is a bit of therapy for me because I get to work through these cases. And I, and I look, there are undeniably, humorous moments in this right so to not tip your hat at that uh would be wrong and and be incomplete in storytelling so i i think you have to see the humor in it see the dark nature of it and know at the end of the day you're bringing attention to to, to a worthwhile uh cause and you really, um, yeah. i truly i truly believe that you know uh, the pr podcast, just once again, that he's talking about is called Predators I've Caught with Chris Hansen, where he does go back and 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 talk to these uh, people from To Catch a Predator and kind of uh, puts a little more light on their situations. But you really are the most reliable. I always talk about reliable narrators on this show. And you're a very reliable narrator, somebody that we can trust, somebody that has like kind of this beautiful, rich voice. The deadpan is just amazing. And you never back down from anything. And you're just, so, I mean, it, it's very, it's like this weird mix of Norman Rockwell and Edward R. Murrow. It's just really <laughs> fast. No, it's really, no, it's like one of those really fascinating things. So you are so compelling to watch and you guys i really recommend i signed up myself today for the true blue streaming network i'm going to put all the information on there it took me less than two minutes to sign up but he currently has two shows on there true crime nation with chris hansen and then of course takedown which is kind of the update of the legendary to catch a predator series uh but also he has his youtube channel i'll put that up there his instagram his twitter i mean there is so many places to find chris hansen and like the amazing work he's done over the last couple of decades uh that he's been really uh just doing just fascinating work but this has been such an honor to talk to you mr hansen and i really really appreciate your time today well ryan thank you very much for having me on i appreciate that and and uh you know we'll be adding new content to uh true blue uh, every week and uh we'll be as you mentioned true crime nation will premiere in the next uh, week or so and and um you know we're going to start putting it out every week so it's it's a, it's a busy, demanding schedule. We have a lot of great people working on the team, and uh, I, I'm just very excited about the, the uh, material that we're going to be able to produce here. You said you are doing the story about the, the, the four teens murdered in-, in We're working, we're, it's in production right now, yeah. Yeah, okay. so that's, the, okay. we, did the, we did the Q Club, and that's going to be on uh, next, and we have a lot of other stories, and you know, the, the two, uh, girls who were murdered in Delphi, Indiana. I was out there when that happened back uh, in 2017. We've been following it ever since, in, in one way or the other. And so we'll have a uh, we'll have some they just reporting on that rest, and, yeah. and many other things. Yeah, they sure did. And then they just yesterday or the day before this, this this very interview, they released some information on the affidavit. That, that that case still haunts me, by the way, to this very day. You know the motive in that and everything else. So uh, it's. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 a, certainly no shortage of material for true crime nation. Uh, Chris Hansen, thank you so much for being here today. I hope uh, our paths cross somewhere down the line in not a bad way. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. <laughs> not Bye. in a dark kitchen. <laughs>